Chris Sanders, Community All Unite TV, and Channel 190 and 1097 on Thursdays from 8 to 8.30. We are here again with a special guest, and I, you know, I worked hard to get this guest for you guys. Yes, Tracy Cosby, attorney at law and ex-municipal judge, or former municipal judge. Uh, Irvington, what was the other city? Plainfield. Plainfield, Plainfield, New Jersey. That's, that was my hometown. I want you to tell them a little bit about yourself, and then we're going to start, you know, really digging into some some really good jewels for these commu this community. Uh, well, okay. Tracy, yeah, please. Well, thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. It's a pleasure to be here, finally yeah. to speak with you. Sure. Um, well, I, I don't know. Should I go back to birth? Uh, <laughs> you know what? I, wa I want you to go back to the, po to the point where you started formulating ideas. I, I want to go back to the dreamer. I want to talk. I want you to. What kind of dreams did you have? Well, I was dreaming of becoming a professional dancer, mm -hmm. ballet, jazz, modern. Yeah. Uh, those were the techniques that I studied mm -hmm. uh, from the time that I was five years old. Mm -hmm. So I think that I was, in fact, even when I drive now, occasionally, when I'm listening to music, where other people will just be listening to music, yeah. I will be in my head dancing. Mm -hmm. And my body will not perform that way anymore. But I still see myself dancing as I'm listening to music. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one of the dreams that I had very early on. And uh, I was always somewhat of a leader, and I don't think that we discussed that. More of an organizer, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, not a leader as far as the classroom was concerned, right. but kind of like that organizer within my little clique. Mm -hmm. um, so I was always thinking of ways perhaps to be an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and you know let's put together this particular plan or let's put together this group mm -hmm. so I was always very social in that regard mm -hmm. um, but I had a charmed life I mm -hmm. can't complain I really did and mm -hmm. a charmed childhood mm -hmm. because my parents were uh, the models that I needed to create a foundation to move me forward even when I did not take the path that was necessarily expected of me mm -hmm. um, so you know I, I as you know, I was in the military, yeah. and uh, instead of going to college directly after high school, I enlisted in the United States Army. Right. I served in the military here in the United States as mm -hmm. well as in Germany. Right. And I came home, and I looked for a job like everyone else, and those jobs didn't require necessarily a skill mm -hmm. because I didn't have a college education, and I didn't have a particular skill that was transferable from the military. Right. So I worked at the eye doctor, and then I got this gig down at the Atlantic City Casino Harris mm -hmm. as a casino cocktail waitress, right. which was very interesting. And this was in the 80s, so it was still very glamour oriented. Atlantic City was the only location in the, on the East Coast that still had casinos, yeah. and you could make a lot of money. Yeah. And I was able to do that and then still pursue my dream of becoming a dancer still because mm -hmm. I had danced and taken lessons most of my life. Mm -hmm. Took that money earned from the casino and went to uh, London. Yeah. And I lived in London for six months and studied there. And then I came home and I was ready to come home. Interesting thing that I found out about London during the 80s, this was still the late 80s, um, was that it it's not a liberal city. Mm -hmm. um, it is a cosmopolitan city. Now it may have changed. Many years have passed, right. uh, but frankly, I was ready to come home. Mm -hmm. I was ready because people will compare it to New York City and you cannot compare it to New York City. Right, it's right. just a different vibe. Um, the United States, contrary to the oppression historically, contrary to the racism, which is still prevalent, mm -hmm. contrary to all of the negatives, is still the only country where you can enforce the Constitution right. and where you can enforce your equal protection laws and right. due process laws. We mm -hmm. may not always get it naturally the way we should, mm -hmm. but we can enforce it. Mm -hmm. You can't enforce it in some of those other countries. And at that time, something that stood out in my mind when I was in London mm -hmm. was when the plane from Pakistan, and Pakistan, remember in India and in Africa, many of the African nations, mm -hmm. many of the Caribbean nations, they were all colonies and subjects of the crown. Mm -hmm. The crown is Great Britain. Yes. But when they achieved their own independence, they had to be afforded access into 
Great Britain. Right. They very often carried that passport. Mm -hmm. And uh, at some point, you started to really see the outrage, similar to what you've seen here through the Trump era, mm -hmm. of, of people's uh, bias and prejudice kind of rear its ugly head that mm -hmm. you thought didn't exist to the extent that it did. Mm -hmm. And I saw that in London, where they essentially wouldn't let these people off the plane and their subjects. And they're mm -hmm. like, no, turn the plane around. Mm -hmm. And I, and that struck me. It was so odd at that time. And mm -hmm. I was a young woman, very young. You know, yeah. I was in my 20s. Yeah. Um, and I thought, well, that's odd. And then I realized, you know, wherever you went, it's a caste system there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And black people who were very new in that country, who were primarily from the Caribbean or Africa, mm -hmm. um, and this was known to the the British, right? right? So if you're black, they look at you and they're like, from the Caribbean or from Africa, and you were one of our colonies, you're one of our subjects. Right. And therefore, you're almost automatically at a lower caste. And people don't like to talk about this, especially people from over there, because, you know, every place is better than America. Mm -hmm. but that's why everybody's here, right? We come mm -hmm. here for a reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but it's the reality. It's And it may have changed now, so you have to be old enough to understand that. Mm -hmm. And I think that for me, when I opened my mouth, it was, oh, you're a Yankee. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it somehow shifted the dynamic because I wasn't there looking for opportunity. Because right. remember, there's economic opportunity being there. Yeah. Now, I've kind of gone off on a tangent because I was a history major in college. Yeah. So, I, oh, okay. <laughs> so I evaluate everything in terms of a historical perspective. And I always remember that. And when I reflect it and, and think about my life. Mm -hmm. um, when I didn't understand it at the time, yeah. I put it into context as someone who's older who now looks back at those things sure. that have transpired. Sure. But nonetheless, I stayed in London and I had a great time, but it wasn't someplace that I wanted to stay. I wasn't willing to fight for it. I wasn't willing to get my passport extended. Right. I was happy to return to the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I returned to the United States and I resumed taking some dance classes. I took some dance classes at Maria Friaca School of Dance. And I think that I may have gone back over to Ailey and taken a few classes. Yeah. But I also was aging out of that dream. Mm -hmm. right. I was aging out of it. Yeah. And I was struggling to find myself. Okay. Because I didn't really know what I was going to do. Right. Um, and I, so I just took another job and I lucked up. Um, at this credit and collection company here in New Jersey that was publicly owned mm -hmm. and um, was able to ascend through the ranks into management mm -hmm. and was still going to college, working my way through college at the time. Mm -hmm. And I met my husband sure. and married and uh, when it developed community service base and NAACP and uh, fell in love with advocacy and civil rights. Mm -hmm. And eventually went to law school, right. and that's how that happened. Yeah. So I, I, that's I, an abridged version, <laughs> right? Right. Right. You know, one of the things that threads that I, I I keep seeing in your story is the fact that you were fearless. Like, for instance, when you said that your your mother took you to the Alvin Ailey and you were dancing with all these older dancers, you right. weren't intimidated. No, but but that's because I have been dancing since I was very young. I may have been a little intimidated. I can I have visions in my mind when I first got there of the, the, the dressing rooms and you go in there and I remember looking at these dancers and you know, at the time, you know, it wasn't the norm to have shaved all the hair off of your body. <laughs> and I was and but dancers did. Yeah. So that was a great exposure looking at these adult twenty year old women and I was maybe twelve, yeah. maybe thirteen. Mm -hmm. Um and then just, you know, oh that was a wonderful, wonderful experience and taking the Horton classes and um no, I don't know if that was so much me being fearless, it was just part of the socialization. Mm -hmm. And when my mother said, this is the only time you can go, and she right. basically said, here she is, she yeah. can dance already, yeah. you know, and they tested me out. So when you looked at the other dancers, did you see that you can think, you could, you're going to be able to dance better than them soon? I don't know if I thought that way, because Chris, you know what, I'm very humble. Mm -hmm. I talk a lot, you yeah. know, I mean, I talk a lot and I'll share my story. And I'm I'm not biblical mm -hmm. religious, yeah. but I'm somewhat spiritual. Yeah. And I just believe in humility. Mm -hmm. So I never never I don't like to even utter or think like I'm better than that or I can do better than that. So it's not I a try to stay away from that. Dance is a competitive sport. No, it's not really. No? no, it's not. No. And I don't do dance offs because it's not supposed to be competitive. It's really supposed to be where you gel. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And that's based on the choreographer and the teacher. Right. And they should be able to have everyone aligned so that you are working together. It's seamless. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't be competing against my fellow dancer because then we're not going to be seamless. Right. The choreography is going to be off. Okay. Unless we're freestyling, mm -hmm. we should be, you know, all together. together. You know, um, so it's not really competitive unless you are auditioning. Right. Obviously, an audition is always competitive. Mm -hmm. you, know? you know, they have those like uh, they have some teen shows now, and they always have it from the aspect of them competing against each other to get that that, that title shot or the the, the front right. line position. But that's, that's but that's not training and that's not performing. Mm -hmm. That's pure audition. Okay. So it's competing, auditioning for the purposes of ascending. So mm -hmm. then, yes, it's absolutely a competition. Right. But when you are truly performing, mm -hmm. you're performing part of a troupe, right. right? Or you're performing in class, then you have to be together. Okay. You know, I mean, if, if you're... Because there's not really a lead on, on a lot of Unless these. you are the prima ballerina. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you have a specific... Then you've got a specific choreography just for you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, yeah. and, and, and it, it's it's it, you know that this is your role, right? And the roles are given to us, mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. follow the roles that are given to us, and we do it to the best of our ability, right? But I shouldn't be competing, you know. It's not as far as our performance is concerned. Yes. Um, but I'm competitive. Yeah. I'm quietly competitive. But then the fearlessness, then it moved to you, you know, possibly going to London. And, and then are you going to what, what was the other place that you said? Uh, I'm just saying how you used to you 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 wouldn't mind leaving oh. the comfort zone <laughs> and going and yeah. doing things like yeah. going to the army. Yeah. That's it. The army, yeah. London, yeah. those are things that are intimidating in itself. Yeah, I, I don't. I may have gotten that from my father. Mm -hmm. My father was a real ro role model to me. Yeah, um, extraordinary person. God rest his soul. I can't even talk about him because I get emotional still. Mm -hmm. It's been six years. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm definitely my father's child. I mean, right. I love my mother, you know, mm -hmm. but right. I'm definitely my father's child intellectually, as far as adventure is concerned, mm -hmm. as far as, you know, being out in the community, willing to do things. Yes. You know, I'm definitely my father's child. Mm -hmm. So I think that by watching him, um, and my uncles as well, who were all very active in the community, just kind of gives you a sense that you have a contribution to make, but also that you can't be afraid to live. Yeah. yeah. Right? You can't be afraid to live because right. life is too short. Mm -hmm. So uh, we worry about just doing the things that keep us safe all day um, and staying in our home and going to work and going to school. We mm -hmm. never advance intellectually. Sure. We don't advance as far as our experiential you know, knowledge is concerned. Yeah. And we don't advance anyone else. Right. Because we're limiting ourselves. And your parents were never afraid that somebody's gonna take advantage of you. Like you going out to, to <laughs> Al, you know, Alvin Alley too. I mean, I, I'm just watching these shows on TV and it's always like some type of a a little bit of a you know, one person wants to take the the, the, the reins or so to speak and they have this little competition in, in there. I know that you're supposed to be dancing together, but then some people are jealous of your skill. I, I think it just depends on what you're doing and where you are. Mm -hmm. um, as far as taking advantage of me... Yeah, the uh, army, you know, they all these storylines of these well, yeah, women being... It's real talk. Yeah, yeah. It's real talk. Yeah. I, could, I don't... I'm sure that my parents worried about me. Yeah. I'm sure that they worried about me. Um, I believe that they may have, you know, worried, but I think they also knew that they have, uh, that they equipped me yes. um, with the insight mm -hmm. um, and the antenna, if you will. Yes. My antenna is always up. It's mm -hmm. still up. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I sometimes think I have eyes in the back of my head yeah. because I pay attention to my surroundings. Sure. Um, so uh, maybe they knew that I wasn't naive. Right. Uh, but uh, and, the, and the, the stories in the military are true. I mean, yeah. I, I've, I've known things mm -hmm, mm -hmm. about people. I've yeah. known things to happen to people. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have the statistics. I, I'm not an expert. I don't necessarily feel comfortable um, talking about some of the negative aspects of the army and the experience that women have had historically sure, sure. but i do know women who were 
sexually assaulted. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can see the men who were accused of doing it. Right. Um, I remember the structure and the way in which things evolved. I remember a level of racism in the military. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, because it's always the structure, the hierarchy, right? Because racism is not a thing in and of itself. It can't be held, in my belief, by everyone. Mm -hmm. It is systemic. It is structural. Right. So it means who holds the power right. in this institution to be able to impose yeah. these restrictions on some people and advance others. Mm -hmm. You know, and there from is how I think racism evolves. So if you if you're a young person that's possibly a high school student and you're interested in going into service, what would be things that would p protect you, or what would be things that you should look out for or avoid, and to keep you safe in that environment? Oh well. <laughs> I mean, because you you were able yeah. to. Yeah. I know if you saw your antenna was up, something raised yeah. the antenna up. I think it was up before then. I mm -hmm. think my antenna has always been up because mm -hmm. I was never someone who was sitting in the house. I had that, I always had like one air open, where's the party, yeah. you know, where you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> friends on both sides of the railroad track, if you will. Yeah. Um, I don't, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm not really an advocate for women going into the military mm -hmm. right now. Right. Um, unless they had a specific purpose or they were an officer. Mm -hmm. But as an enlisted woman, unless you're coming from the Mississippi Delta, right. you know, you're coming from Louisiana in certain areas and this is an opportunity for you to go to school, mm -hmm. uh, for you to support your family if you yes. have children. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to um, develop uh, leadership skills sure. to develop discipline mm -hmm. and to get a paycheck mm -hmm. and to get the veteran benefits. Right. That's not why I went in there and it wasn't necessary for me to go in for those purposes. Mm -hmm. So I, I suppose that I can't give the advice as to what anyone should do to go in or mm -hmm. not to go in because it's an individual circumstance. Yeah. So if your circumstances are such that you live in abject poverty mm -hmm. and that you have an opportunity to get out and travel the world and to do these things through the military, which will also give you an opportunity to educate yourself, then yeah. you'll do it. Mm -hmm. But you have to be mindful that you go into the military for the purposes of preparing for war. Yes, There's no other reason to be in the military. Mm -hmm. That's what you do. It right. is a microcosm of society, but the industry is preparing for Ooh. war, preparing to defend the United States. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand at all times, you can be called upon to truly serve your country. Sure. So you can't just go in. Well, I'm just going in to be able to, you know, get my veterans education benefits. You know, I'm just going in for a check, mm -hmm. you know, because you're preparing for war or to service the soldiers who will be on the front on the battlefield. Right. Um, and, and that's and that's essential. Right. Mm -hmm. People have to do it. Yeah. So if I were to advise someone, I would have to counsel them and understand what their exact circumstances were, right. why they were going to do it, mm -hmm. you know, and what were their other options. Right. So now when you when you're in there, you were a free spirit before you went in. You I were so. a, yeah. you're a dreamer and you're you're more arts arts. -y. Yeah, yeah. That's like a shock to your system because now you have to be regimented and then of course listen to what other folks have to tell you to do. How did you make that that change? Very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't a great soldier at first. Mm. It was it was absolutely because even my parents, I mean, I mean, they weren't super strict on me. Right. I, I came from liberal parents mm -hmm. um, and with liberal occupations. You know? yeah. right, right, right. I mean, my father was an intellectual, but he, you know, at, not but, but he was an intellectual. And so he saw things differently and specifically to you and what are all the variables and, you know, and so there was no black or white. Yeah. You know, there were there were a lot of gray zones. Sure. And so um, for me, I was to my detriment, to some extent, allowed to just kind of do what I wanted within limits. Mm -hmm. I probably needed them to be a little stricter. Right. 
Um, I mean, they didn't let me stay out all night. They didn't let me have people, men spending the night, like, yeah, none of that. Yeah, right. But at the same time, they weren't cracking the whip for me to be sitting at the table with no television on for mm -hmm. three hours doing my homework. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, I... I, I <laughs> that strict uh, regimen helped you become... Uh, you know, a judge or an attorney because that you need that, you know, discipline. The military um, gave me a level of discipline that mm -hmm. I did not otherwise have. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't an easy transition. Yes. The transition took some time. Mm -hmm. And then I realized I'm not going to fail this. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the competitiveness of me looking around and saying, I'm not, no, there's no way that they're going to put me out of this. Mm, right, yeah. And um, and then that's when you realize, you know what, let me comply. Right. Let me comply. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> you know, it's like submit now and complain later. You know, right. that's that's what we tell people when they stop by the police. Yeah, yeah. So you save yeah, your life, yeah, yeah. submit, mm -hmm. complain later. Right, right. <laughs> um, but, and so that's kind of what I did. And, it, you know, it was almost like the light bulb came on. Right. And I realized that I just needed to comply. And then I was able to better embrace it. Mm -hmm. And then, it, you know, you're always developing the mental toughness along with the physical toughness. Sure. Because you do have to endure someone talking to you like crap initially during mm -hmm. basic training. And mm -hmm. you have to physically be fit. Yes. Um, and then I, it was just, when I got to Germany, it was wonderful. It was mm -hmm. wonderful, beautiful country. And um, but, but I did my time. I did three years active, three years inactive on a six-year contract. And that was it. I wasn't a lifer. I wasn't supposed to be a lifer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, God put me in that position for a reason. It was to develop me in certain ways and to give me insight about the world because I traveled to Switzerland. Traveled to Spain, Holland, the Barbarian Alps. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, of course, I was in Germany already, south of France. And, um, you know, I don't know if I would have had that opportunity. Now the world is so small. People are traveling every day. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. they weren't doing that in the 80s. Right. So I came back with this body of knowledge, international body of knowledge, that a lot of people didn't have. And it didn't even matter whether they had it or not. For me, in my mind, the way I viewed the world, Mm -hmm. It became much smaller before the internet. Did you have a mentor that guided you to the service, or was it just something that you decided to do? It was, a, well, Chris. <laughs> I wanted to attend Stanford, right. and I was told by my counselor, my guidance counselor, after he laughed, yeah. no, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. You don't have the grades for that. Mm -hmm. And it was just ironic how people come into your lives, mm -hmm. and we can't discount why people come into our lives. Mm -hmm. They come into our lives for various reasons. Sure. And I don't know whether it was a week, a month, but it was a very short proximity. A recruiter came in. Mm -hmm. And I, to this day, I remember this recruiter and his name was Larry. Mm -hmm. He was a tall, dark, handsome man named Larry. Yeah. And he was a sergeant and he said, you know, well, you know, they told us, you know, how they announced and they mm -hmm. say, okay, the recruiter is here today from the uh, army. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a few of my girlfriends were like, oh, okay, we don't have to go to class. We can go see this recruiter. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and that's what we did. And he said, you could do the buddy buddy system. Mm -hmm. You travel all over together, still go to college, mm -hmm. go overseas. And, and my mind was just clicking. And I was like, well, I can't go to Stanford. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm not the greatest student. I'm kind of tired of school right now. Yeah. College was always going to be part of my plan. Right. They were going to help facilitate it. Mm -hmm. But yet it wasn't going to be, you know, where I'm leaving high school and going straight there. I needed, you know, to spread my wings in a different way, I think. Right. Right. And I went and took the test. And um, that was that. Mm -hmm. And I was 17. And, you know, you, you had to wait until you, you can't go in the military until you're 18, 18 now. It's not like the old days during Vietnam when they were taking people who were 17. So I, yeah. um, and uh, that's my story with hmm. that. When you went to London, what, did, you, did you hear about, in the chance that where James Baldwin and all, all those? James Baldwin did live in London. Yeah. Oh, that, not, not at that time. I was so young. I think we got this, we got some good stuff here for, for the young folks. And I, I wanna I wanna make do a part two, but I know your your time is very, very precious and valuable. And I wanna thank you for oh. this. Is there, if there's anything that I haven't covered that you wanted to talk about, you know, I well, love Well, you know, I mean it's your interview. It's my interview, right? <laughs> I feel I'm fulfilled because one of the things I, I like 
to, to leave with is any young person that is interested in, in getting in the legal profession. I mean, what what kind of, it, it seems like you have, you've come from it from another angle. Yes. It's not the standard, you know, I wanted to be a lawyer uh, and this is something that I, I feel like this is, I'm the best writer and I love writing briefs and I love to follow a certain mentor that, you know, it seemed like you, you have more of the artistic creative because they say that creatives um, are also great lawyers. I mean, I've heard that before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you know, what's interesting is that in law school, they look for people who are very diverse in their yes, background. Right. You know, I think, and this is something, as soon as someone tells me, oh, I'm a criminal justice major, I'm like, why? Mm -hmm. Why am I going to go to law school? Well, if you're a criminal justice major and you tell me you want to go to the FBI, wonderful. Right. But if you're a criminal justice major or, you, or a political science major, which those are the typical fields yeah. that are the feeder fields, mm -hmm, if you mm -hmm, will, for mm -hmm. law school, the, everybody's saturated. Right. And law schools aren't looking at that. They mm -hmm. want people who have science background. Mm -hmm. They want the English teacher because sure. they know that you can probably write. Right, right. You know, the mathematician because mm -hmm. they need patent lawyers. Yeah. You know, they are looking for people who, I'm a musician, I'm, you know, I'm a dancer. They want people who are involved in community service. Yes. Because ultimately what they want mm -hmm. are people who are going to stand out later in their career. Yes. And not just be part of the mold. Mm-hmm. Those who are going to break the mold will go on to ascend like a Barack Obama. Sure, right, right, right. right. Like a, a, a Vice President Harris. Mm -hmm. um, so these are the people who may have different things about them that stand out mm -hmm. where they can now shine a favorable um, impression upon their school. Mm -hmm. Notable alumni. Yeah. You know, I mean, and listen, and I... Look, Half of this is my perception. Yeah. I've not worked as a dean or a recruiter for a law school. Mm -hmm. It's just based on what I observed and what I've been told. Right. And it makes sense. Yeah. You know, it yeah. makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not always even about the highest scoring LSAT right. or the highest GPA. Yes, there's a matrix. They want to make sure that you're going to come in. They're, they're not going to affect their attrition rate. Sure. You're going to be able to stay there and do well. Mm -hmm. But they want people who are different, who are going to go out and change the world. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And because you change the world, they know that they have contributed in some way to that. Right. And it makes their school look good. Right. That means that they have now become more competitive for these new people that come in. Mm -hmm. So when they looked at, if I was a, a a uh, person that was looking for you to be a lawyer, I would have said, okay, she's she's artistic, she danced, she used to dance. Then she went into the army, so she was able to conform to the rigidness of an army. Then she went to you know the, to London, and then she then she, London. <laughs> well, then then she went to the NAACP. So that you you covered all of those those traits that you just described. I think that I had a lot of the subjective traits. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I had a lot of the subjective traits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there's the objective and the subjective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm. Yeah, I think that's see that. I think that's a good way of ending this. And we will be thanking everybody. We want to thank you for coming, definitely. And I want to thank all the viewers for for tuning in because if you did tune in and you did not pick up some jewels and gems. For a third person or a young person that wants to be in the legal profession or a young person that's that's has some type of fear of exploring life, you she just represented that. I wish I didn't I wanted to travel. I was afraid. But then I also see myself as a social person. I think I could be dropped somewhere and, and do well, <laughs> but I never took the test. I never tested my my thought process. And all I would have needed is some five thousand dollars. <laughs> that was a lot of money back then. Yeah, yeah. By I mean, the way. Uh, it didn't work in when you get there too. That's a beautiful thing. So thank you, Tracy, You're welcome, for your time. Chris. Thank you for having and me. And I, you know, we're, we definitely want you to do the legal uh, anal analytical part of it eventually. Oh, you know, okay. On our next time, and you know, we can find some time to bring you to the table. Community All Unite TV, Comcast Cable, and Xfinity. Channel 190 and 1097 every Thursday from 8 to 8.30. Another beautiful interview, and we're going to bring so much more information to you. So please stay tuned. Thank you very much. Community. It's a fight, it's a fight now. Right now. It's a fight, it's a fight now. Community.